Hi there, welcome to Nepi Invest. Finally, we are getting to the top five of the best performed companies on the ASX since 2013. And to be honest with you, it shouldn't be a surprise what company came at number one. In fact, a few of the companies that came in the top five, I was not surprised at all. Now, even though this is looking at the best performed companies on the ASX, I did have some rules behind which type of companies I included in this list. So let's have a look at some of those rules or points in how I came up with this list of top 30 companies on the ASX since 2013. The first very important point is this list of top 30 companies, including the top five here that I'll be showing you in today's video is completely objective. This is not my opinion. It is based off total analyze returns over the past 10 years. I use Guru Focus uh, um, for quite a few of the metrics I'm using in the video today. And some of the metrics that Guru Focus to produce, I'm a little bit skeptical of, but not total analyzed returns. So that includes capital gain or share price appreciation, and also includes dividends. Now, I only include companies that have been listed since 2013, because we're talking about over the past 10 years. So it's a little bit ridiculous to include companies that only IPO'd in 2018. And that's uh, one of the reasons why a company like WiseTech is not featured in this particular list. And if it was, then maybe if I was looking at the best performing companies over the past five years, WiseTech might be the top of that particular list. I also excluded quite a few companies, including mining companies. And the main reason I exclude mining companies is because uh, mining companies uh, are cyclical. And it's all about timing when it comes to performance of those companies. And I want to get rid of that cyclicality. And uh, because mining companies are completely cyclical, I didn't want to include any mining companies. And probably some of the best performed companies since 2013 in terms of share price appreciation have actually been lithium companies, companies like Pilbara, uh, or Alcom, companies like that, or also excluded companies that have not been generating revenue. So those companies include Niren Pharmaceuticals, which is in fact one of the best performed, if not the best performed company on the ASX in terms of share price over the past 10 years. And I am a shareholder of that company and I've decided to exclude that company from this particular list. So all I wanted to um, to reveal is companies that are profitable, or mostly companies are profitable, generating revenue, and are not completely cyclical. And I only included companies with a markup above $1 billion as of 31st of May, 2023. Now, I probably at this point will actually do another video of those best performed companies with a markup below $1 billion, because there are some interesting companies within that list. But probably the most important point is that past, past performance is not a predictor for future success. And I believe, if I remember correctly, I did show you uh, Microsoft in a previous video because between 2003 and 2013, Microsoft share price did nothing. It went sideways. But between 2013 and 2023, Microsoft is one of the best performed companies in the world. So you can't look at a 10 year period and just think, well, that's a performance of that company is going to follow through to the next 10 years. And I think this is a very important point. I think I also mentioned James Hardy because that company was featured in one of my other videos. And the performance of that company over the past 10 years has been quite good. But if you look at the period between 2003 and 2013, James Hardy did absolutely nothing at will. So there is potential that the best performed company in this list today may not be in this list of top 30 companies between 2023 and 2033. So it's very important to try to find those companies that will perform really good over the next 10 years. That's the main reason we are investing. It's not based off past performance. It's based off what we think or how we think they will perform over the next decade or even longer. And in fact, that's one of the reasons why I'm doing this video. I want to see if there's any characteristics that we can see, find, that determine whether a company is going to perform really well over the next 10 years. And there are some characteristics. 
So the other thing I also have been looking at is the worst performing companies on the ASX. And it has become quite clear when you look at some of the metrics of these worst performing companies, particularly revenue growth, return investor capital, that there are some very common characteristics between these bad performing companies. And I wouldn't even have to have a look at revenue growth to know that the revenue growth of these worst performing companies on the ASX is going to be really low. In fact, the best performed company out of these five companies in terms of revenue growth in the past 10 years is only 2.5. Uh, earnings per share growth, negative for four of these companies. Dividend growth, positive for four of the companies, but negative for one of them. And return on investor capital, below 10 for all five companies. And the common theme I have found among the worst performing companies is lackluster revenue growth and really low return on invested capital. So just keep that in mind as we look at the top five best performed companies on the ASX since 2013. The other thing you'll notice here, the analyzed return for these five companies, not awful. So you're still getting a positive return. In fact, positive 5% return for Bigger Cheese, Argo Investments, and AOLQ. So a lot of that positive return is because of dividends, but you're not going to beat the market if you're investing in these types of companies. These type of companies that have low revenue growth and really low return invested capital. Now into the top five companies and coming in at number five is Altium. And this is not a surprise. I actually expected Altium to be in the top five. In fact, I thought it might've been a little bit higher than come than fifth place. But when you look at revenue growth, and that is revenue per share growth, earnings per share growth, dividend per share growth, and return invested capital, it's quite simple why this company is one of the best performing companies on the ASX, particularly when you compare those metrics to the worst, worst performing companies. So remember, those worst performing companies had peppered really bad revenue growth and also return invested capital less than 10. For our team, return or revenue per share growth, 16.2%, earnings per share growth, 27.9% per year, dividend per share growth, 16.9% per, per year. The other thing I'll point out here is earnings per share growth greater than revenue growth, which is telling us that the margins of this company have improved. Now, that does not necessarily mean margin will in, margins will in, improve um, moving forward, um, but if they do, we could still, still see uh, earnings per share of this company expand at a greater rate than revenue growth. Return investor capital, 18.6. That's in the sweet spot. Now, I probably would prefer return gas capital to be maybe a little bit higher, but 18.6 is a beautiful return on investor capital for any company. So you can understand why our team has performed really well compared to those worst performing companies just by looking at some of these numbers. And that's why the analyzed total return of our team has been 40.9% per year. Now, the one thing I do like to compare is the analyzed return to the revenue and earnings per share growth. Now, if the analyzed return is greater than the revenue growth and particularly the earnings per share growth, that means there has been some multiple expansion. That means the PE ratio of this company has increased over the past 10 years. And there is one thing to be wary about when you do see a company go through a period of multiple expansion, there's always that potential that the complete opposite might happen for that company. You might see a company go through a period of multiple contractions. So even if the company grows their financials, even if the earnings per share grow, there is that potential. The share price might do nothing, might just go sideways because of multiple contraction. That's exactly what happened to Microsoft between 2003 and 2013. The company grew during that period, but the company went through a period, a 10-year period of multiple contraction. So that's the one thing, the one thing I'd be wary about when it comes to Altium. I believe they can continue to grow moving forward. And my only concern is that the market is or will be less and less willing to pay a premium for this company. And that's one of the reasons why the share price really hasn't done much over the past few years. So let's have a look at the chart uh, to see the chart for one of the best performed companies on the ASX. So all the charts I'm gonna be showing you are 10 year weekly charts. And to be honest with you, when you look at Altium's chart uh, between 2013 and 2019, 20, beautiful chart, share price increased from about $2 all the way to a high of $42, a 21 bagger over about a seven year period. 
And then COVID-19 happened, share price dropped to about $24. And then the share price really hasn't done anything ever since. Share price has been going sideways. We did see a brief period where the share price shot up to an all-time high, about a $45 or so. And that was uh, towards the start or end of 2021, start of 2022. But honest with you, share price really done nothing. Now, the one thing I will notice here is that three times the share price has got to $24 and a fair bit of buying came in. So $24 seems to be the floor, a share price floor for our team. Now, the share price right now is around about $38. So I don't think it's likely the share price will get back to $24, but you never know. But if I do see the share price get to $24, this would be an automatic buy for me. Now, the PE ratio is still fairly high, and the company has to keep on growing to justify that PE ratio. And again, my main concern is that the market is going to be less willing to pay a premium for this company. But if the company can hit their goals for the future, there is a potential that the company's share price will move back into an uptrend over the next few years. Coming in at number four is Hub24, a company I've done zero research on. Now, there are a lot of companies on the ASX, and for some reason, Hub24 is one of those companies I just have not looked at. And maybe that's to my detriment because the analyzed return for this company is 41.8% per year over the past 10 years. Pretty good revenue growth at 51.3%. But if we go back 10 years ago, this company had no earnings, no dividend. That's why you can't really calculate the earnings per share growth and the dividend growth. And in fact, this company listed on the ASX in the middle of 2013. So this company has been a listed entity for almost exactly 10 years. Return on equity, 5.1. But it's just that revenue growth, really impressive revenue growth. And I've also heard some really good things about the products and services that Hub24 do have. I believe they're into administration of super and that sort of thing. So not much else to say about Hub24, uh, apart from that really fantastic revenue growth and a brilliant analyzed total return. So let's have a look at the chart for Hub24. And another fantastic chart we have here. And it's really funny that if we go back to when the company lists on the ASX in 2013, share price did nothing for about two years. Share price went sideways at around about $1. Yes, the share price of this company has increased from $1, and you could have bought in at 2015 at $1, all the way up to about $28. This has been a 28 bagger over the last eight years. So the market has always been impressed by this company. Well, not always, particularly from about 2015, it's been impressed by this company. We did see a little bit of a dip in 2020, which is understandable. And then the massive increase in share price during 2020 into 2021, share price went from about $6 to a high of $34 um, or $35. But share price really has done nothing since then. But overall, if you do look at the long-term trend, share price is in an uptrend. Now, only three times in the past three years has the share price fallen below the 150-week moving average. That was during the COVID-19 financial panic during that May-June panic in 2022 and for a very brief period of time in September. So it does seem like that 150-week moving average is a nice support level for this company. And the share price right now is just above that level after the share price bounced off that moving average just a few months ago. Coming in, number three is not a shock at all. I totally expected Objective to be in this list today. This is a company I have never owned. I have followed quite closely. But it has always looked expensive, always looked expensive. And I've just been thinking, well, there's no reason to take a position in this company because the risk rewards are just not there. There's more risk than rewards, but the market has completely disagreed with me. And it seems like the, the P ratio of this company just keeps on expanding up until about a year ago. Now, when you compare revenue growth, earnings per share growth to the analyzed total return, there is a disconnect there. And that means that has, this company has gone through a significant period of multiple expansion. The market is more and more willing to pay a premium for this company. So revenue per share growth, only 10.6% per year. I was surprised about that number. I expected a little bit more. Earnings per share growth at 17.1%. So the margins of this company have improved over the past 10 years. Whether that improvement will continue remains to be seen. Dividend growth of 15 But those numbers, those growth numbers between 10 and 20, I probably would have expected more for a company that has seen an analyzed total return of 45.5% per year. 
in the return on invested capital only at 14.8. So that's sort of in line with their revenue and earnings per share growth. So a little bit lower than I did expect. And the reason those metrics are a little bit lower compared to the analyzed total return is because of multiple expansion. The market is more and more willing to pay a premium for this company up until recently. And to be honest with you, when you look at the weekly chart for objective, the hype in this company was really, really exploded in 2020, just after the COVID-19 financial panic. Share price of this company went from $4 up to $22 in about uh, two years of trading. So that's a five bagger in a fairly short period. So that was where we saw significant multiple expansion. In fact, I'm going to show the P history of this company in the next slide. But if we go back to 2013, share price of this company was less than one. In fact, it was more like 50 cents. So the share price of this company has increased from 50 cents to a current share price of $14, $13. The other thing you'll see is the share price has been under pressure over the past year, year and a half. Share price has dropped from $22 down to about that $13 level. Now, it does seem like the downtrend in the share price has come to an end. So I actually have put Objective Corporation onto my watch list for possibly a sneaky buy. If I see a breakout, in the share price because this is a high quality company. I just think it is overvalued even at these levels. And this is the PE ratio history of Objective Corporation. And this really showcases the multiple expansion that you do see in some of these best performed companies. And that is one of the ways these companies are on this list. Not only do you have do you see financial expansion, but you also need that multiple expansion. You need to see the PE ratio actually increase through time. So for Objective Corporation, back in 2013, the PE ratio for this company was around 12. Can you imagine that? You could have bought this highly growing, high quality company with a PE ratio of 12. Now, back in 2013, more than likely, we wouldn't have rated Objective Corporation as a high quality company. And then over time, we have just seen that PE ratio climb, gently climb between 2013 and 2019. In 2019, PE ratio of this company was around 40, which still seems fairly high. In fact, it got to 40 in 2015. So significant model expansion between 2013 and 2015. But that multiple or PE ratio exploded after COVID-19. It went from about 40, 45 all the way up to 125. Yes, the PE ratio of this company was 125 when the share price reached its peak of $22. And remember that revenue growth, earnings per share growth was not spectacular. It was between about 10 and 20%. And since then, the PE ratio of this company has dropped from 125 down to less than 60. But still, that is fairly high for a company with those sort of growth uh, numbers. So I probably would expect the growth numbers to be a little bit higher. But again, the, the market loves this company, absolutely loves this company, and is willing to pay a premium for Rejective Corp. And that's why, even though the share price has halved since it's high, the PE ratio is still around 60. Coming in number two is Pinnacle. I know absolutely nothing about this company. I think they are a fund manager. And I I have no interest in fund managers, that sort of thing. And that's probably the main reason I have never researched this company. But when you look at that to analyze total return of 48% per year, maybe I should be looking at the performance of these companies. But I just remember Magellan was one of the best performing companies on the ASX just a few years ago, yet the share price of this company or that company has completely tanked. Uh, and there are reasons why I don't have much interest in these companies. Uh, revenue growth, negative 7.3%. There must be some story behind that. Maybe they sold off some of their assets. I don't know. But earnings per share growth, 25.6. Return on equity, 18.7. And again, analyzed total return of 48% per year. So they have done things right, done some right things over the past 10 years to get that sort of analyzed total return. But again, this is not the sort of investment for me. And when you do look at the chart, uh, this is you know fairly similar to some of the charts we do see. Uh, share price going from the bottom left to the top right. Share price didn't do much from 2013 to 2016, although maybe that's because the share price was low. So maybe share price did do a fair bit. But if you go back to 2013, you could have bought this company for a share price maybe 10 cents, it seems like. And the current share price is about 
or ten dollars. But there have been periods of time when the share price just explodes. We saw that between 2016 and 2018, share price went from a dollar up to eight dollars. Then the share price pulled all the way back to two dollars fifty. And then post COVID, share price went from about three dollars all the way up to nineteen dollars. And then since then, the share price has pulled back all the way from nineteen dollars to less than ten. So it seems like the sentiment in this particular company, fund manager, whatever you want to call them, um, changes fair, fairly quickly and quite often. Coming in at number one of the best performed companies on the ASX since 2013 is no shock. I totally expected ProMedicus to be the best performed company. In fact, it easily won 62.2% per year. And remember, Pinnacle was 48 or 49 percent per year. So by far, ProMedicus was or is the best performed company on the ASX over the past 10 years. And look at some of these numbers. Revenue growth, revenue per share growth, 24.2 percent per year. Earnings per share growth at 23.7 percent per year. So margins haven't increased that all that much. In fact, probably steady over the past 10 years. Dividend growth, 35.7 percent per year. Return of in, on invested capital, 40. 7.8. That's pretty high. And that's why this company has just gone from strength to strength to strength. You have significant financial expansion, return investor capital, 47.8. And that all leads to an analyzed total return of 62.2% per year. The likelihood of getting those sort of returns over the next 10 years, I think is fairly minimal. I think ProMedicus will continue to grow, but don't expect Analyze returns of 62.2% per year. However, I am a shareholder and I do expect some pretty good returns over the next five to 10 years, but I am not expecting these sort of returns. In fact, I probably don't expect ProMedicus to be in the top 10 best performed companies between 2023 and 2033, but I still expect some pretty good performance. I expect returns between 10 and 20% per year. At the end of May 2013, the share price of ProMedicus was 47 cents. So let me just repeat that. The share price of ProMedicus at the end of May 2013 was 47 cents. Yes, we could have bought this company at 47 cents back year, back 10 years ago. Share price of this company now is $71. So this company is a 140 bagger. In fact, it's higher than that. 140 bagger. Over the past 10 years, I doubt many shareholders uh, or current shareholders of this company bought back in the middle of 2013. So more than likely, they would have taken profits somewhere along the line. And one of the reasons why you do see a little bit of volatility in ProMedicus is just because of the valuation. The P ratio of this company is really, really high. So ProMedicus needs to continue to grow and expand to justify the current share price and valuation. And on occasion, the share price does see a pretty significant dip. We saw a significant dip in the share price in 2000, late 2019, early 2020. Share price went from $37.50 down to $15. So a share price dip of more than 50%. We also saw another significant dip towards the end of 2021 into 2022. Share price dipped from $70 down to $37.50. So not quite a 50% drop in share price. But the share price right now is an all-time high. So the market is still fairly excited about the future of this company and the share price just keeps on going higher. Now, we might see another dip in the next year or two. And if I do see a fairly significant dip, I will add to my position in this company. I have no reason to sell out of ProMedicus just yet, even though the P ratio of this company is significantly higher. It's way higher than I, what I would like, but I'm just, there is that potential that this company keeps on growing at a fantastic rate. And just look at those revenue growth numbers, earning per share growth numbers, and their return on invested capital is really high as well. So a high quality company on the ASX. And uh, even though uh, this company has produced significant returns over the past 10 years, don't expect a 71 bagger over the next 10 years. In fact, if this was a 71 bagger, uh, the market cap of this company would be something ridiculous like $500 billion. And the market cap of this company will never get to $500 billion. And that's all I have really for this video and this series, the best performed companies on the ASX since 2030. We did look at the top 30 and we have seen the best five best performed companies. 
which were Altium, Hub24, Objective Corp, Pinnacle, and coming in number one was Prometicus, which is not a surprise at all because we all know, well, hopefully we all know, we should know, that Prometicus has been an absolute stellar performer over that 10-year period. Whether it can continue going up from here remains to be seen, but don't expect returns of 60 to whatever it present, whatever it is, percent per year over the next 10 years. If you have any thoughts about any companies I featured in today's video, uh, any questions, just leave those in the comment section of this video. Otherwise, I'm not a financial advisor. If you do need financial advice, make sure you seek out someone who is qualified and can speak to your own financial needs. That's it for this video. Have a good day. Bye.